You know, Susie, this is a great ride. The winter months are coming. It is getting colder. A little harder to get on your horse nowadays. It is, and you know, I think it's so important for people to ride their horses and work their horses even during the winter months. Exactly, you know, and that's what we're trying to keep is making sure that these horses are getting ready for spring because winter's gonna come and go really quick and this is the perfect temperature for horses. That's right, and there's a lot of things that you can do with your horse even during the winter months. Absolutely, and that's why we have better horses, keeping everybody motivated to ride. Hello everyone, my name's Ed Adams. And I'm Susie Darushi. And welcome to Better Horse. In our first segment, Better Horses will be off to Midway, Kentucky to meet up with Dan James of Double Dan Horsemanship. Dan is a two-time international world champion colt starter, and he will be introducing us to his two-year-old stallion named Little Oak. We are proud to bring you a special medical moment with Dr. Warren Beer with Kansas State University Veterinarian Health Center. Dr. Beer will take us through a fascinating procedure with a horse's respiratory system. Professional horse trainer Carrie Kuhn from Medicine Lodge, Kansas will walk us through how to correct horses when they become too buddy sour. Alright Susie, so I'm going to name this episode our motivational episode. That's right, we want to challenge everybody watching to do something fun and productive with your horses this winter. That's right, and we want to keep everybody watching Better Horses because it's the only horse show on your local broadcast television station. And also airing on RFD TV. So before you go saddle up, sit back, relax, and enjoy this show. We'll be right back. Sister as a happy horse is always a better performing horse and I believe that if she's healthy from the inside out she's going to be able to perform at her best. She definitely feels good when she is healthy. She you know, wakes up and enjoys her day and therefore I know she's going to be a happy horse and be able to perform when I ask her to. G'day, Dan James here from Double Dan Horsemanship and I'm excited to be here on Better Horses TV. Okay guys, I'm here with a good mate of mine, Elliot from Versatile Horsemanship and he's riding a little two-year-old today and we're going to start a part of my lead change program. It, it's a pretty neat deal, I know there's lots of different ways to do lead changes. Um, I love this particular drill or pattern, uh, what you may want to call it. I think it's a great way to help get these horses um, set up and prepare them not only for the lead change but other transitions. Let's get into it. Okay, all right mate, if you want to go ahead and, and walk off, trot off and then uh, pick up the, the can there to the left for us. So in this deal here, um, we're not even going to actually attempt the lead change um, on this little two-year-old. What we're going to do is just kind of start walking this little horse uh, through the drill. So as Elliot returns back here to centre, he's going to break him back down to the walk. And now he's going to start walking a circle here to the left. And as he's walking this circle here to the left, um, we're going to have him put his inside left leg on and just look at pushing that little horse's hip to the outside, so to the right. And we want to keep, try to keep his head and neck as straight as we can. And we'll just keep bumping that kind of hip, pushing that hip around to the outside uh, through this. As he returns to the center, he's then going to go back up to the trot, back up to the canter, and canter a circle off to the right. So if you'll go ahead and then move him back up to the trot and then up to the canter. The cool thing that I love about this particular um, exercise is that the exercise itself starts to tell you and tell your horse when you're ready to start actually asking for that lead change. It also obviously starts to get to work on other components such as the walk to canter transition, canter to walk transition, because all of those parts are going to be important in the other pieces of your horse's education. So again there, and if your horse was to get a little stuck right there, um, you know, I might pick him up and, you know, turn him around there to the right, getting him off that inside leg and then go back to walking that, that bigger circle. As he gets back there to the center, let's do one more off here to the left. So you're going to look up to that left, go up to the trot, and then break him up there to the canter and ask him to lope off again. And as he returns, he's going to come back to the center, downward transition to the walk, stop and let the horse hang out here in the center. 
So again, in this deal, one of the important parts of it is that we're looking at that horse, um, working through any anxiety that we may build through here, but more importantly, making sure that we're setting this horse up in these other elements that we're doing prior to asking for that lead change. Okay, guys, we've got another one here of Elliot's. This guy here is getting towards the end of his uh, two-year-old year. We didn't go through and work this guy through the same pattern, but asking a little bit more of him. Okay, go ahead and uh, walk off and then look at picking up the canner. Good. So we're looking for that walk to canner transition. Um, that's, got, that's really important uh, in this deal. And as you return to the center there, just kind of let him break back down to the walk. Good, and then walk this circle here to the left. And as you're walking this circle to the left, it'll be your inside left leg on pushing the hip to the outside, that's it. And if you kind of feel him kind of just back off your leg there, don't be afraid to kind of kick him a little bit with both legs, keep sending him forward, that's it, good job. And then as you return the center, you're gonna look up there to the right, and you're gonna do a walk to counter departure to the right. So he looks up, sets him up, and then lopes off to the right, good job. So you can see that this, this little horse here, he's got um, you know, more time on him, so we're able to ask a little bit more um, of him in this, uh, in this deal. So again, let's go back to walk here in the center. And we'll walk a circle here to the left, sorry, to the right, and it'll be, a, uh, again, using your inside right leg this time, keeping that little bit of impulsion there uh, going forward. As you approach that center line uh, through the two circles, think about keeping him uh, straight through the head and the, and the neck and the shoulders, but pushing that hip around. So push that hip around there off that right foot, look up to the left and lope off to the left. Number one, what we're looking for is for them to change clean and for it to be a nice change. Uh, the second thing, which, what, with, with, which is what we just seen, <laughs> is that he changed in front and was late behind. So in that moment, what we did, we had Elliot continue to hold him and keep bumping him with that outside leg. And about three quarters way around, he uh, then got that out, you know, came through from behind. The other thing that you'll have happen is that they don't change at all. In that moment, I just stay in counter canter, counter canter him around, go back and repeat, repeat the drill. At any time that I feel that these horses um, are leaning on my leg, I'm gonna break them back down and move them off where, whichever leg that I feel them, them leaning on. So if I come through and I've asked for that change several times and it's just not happening, you know, it's probably because he's not getting off my leg. So right, there's a great opportunity, breaking back down, walk or, you know, walk that circle in the direction that he's not getting off. So if he wasn't getting off my left leg, I'd walk a circle to the left, getting him off that inside left leg and then take him back to the right. Let's go ahead and we'll try um, a change going the other direction. So I want you to lope around here to the right and we're gonna push his shoulders in on the right. And then it'll be a lead change from his right lead to his left lead. So pick up that canner, loping him around. And canner again, another circle here. And as you're going around, I want you to think about just pushing his shoulders to the inside. So just kind of outside left leg driving those shoulders to that inside. And you just want to go one more circle and just go just a little bit quicker, just keeping, keeping him moving. There you go, good. Shoulders to the inside, pushing those shoulders inside. And as you come through the center, just put that right leg on him and change there to the left. Good job, okay, and go ahead and walk there. So when I, when I start this deal out, if I come through here and I got the change just like Elliot did there, I'll kind of counter past that quarter mark and then I'm gonna just let those, those young horses go back down to the walk, let them walk back here to the center and sit here in, in the center and just kind of let them take that in. Then I would pick it up and go and start the drill all over again. Thanks mate, good job. Stay tuned, we'll be right back right after these messages. How do you define yourself as a cowboy? One is the kind of horse you ride. Another is what kind of hat you wear. J.W. Brooks Custom Hats tailors hats for your lifestyle. I like their hats because they stay on your head. They fit great and they look good too. They also have a wonderful woman's fashionable line of hats. 
J.W. Brooks Custom Hats, a family business. Between J.W., his wife, Jody, and son, Kate. You know, J.W. himself is a Western artist, a country singer, and a master craftsman of hats. My new J.W. Brooks Custom Hat has a wide sweatpants. It has a cushion fit, patented design, and luxurious comfort. This hat is a 100X belly fur. It's the nicest hat I've ever had. You know, J.W. Brooks Custom Hats are smoking good looking. My name is Warren Beard. I'm a professor of equine surgery here at Kansas State University. What K-State has to offer the horse owning public is a specialist in just about every field in uh, equine medicine, surgery, ophthalmology, anesthesia, and including imaging and radiology. Whatever your horse may need, we have a specialist here that uh, can handle it. This is a barrel racing horse and his uh, clinical signs where he made a lot of respiratory noise while working and he uh, ran out of gas very early, didn't have the stamina. So the diagnosis made by the referring veterinarian was uh, left laryngeal hemiplegia. For horses that doesn't have laryngeal hemiplegia, the common name for the procedure is called a tieback. The larynx is right here. This is the trachea. So inspired air comes through the nasal passages, through the larynx, into the trachea. With laryngeal hemiplegia, one of these arytenoid cartilages is paralyzed and hangs down in the airway and limits airflow and it causes noise by have, causing turbulent flow. We make a small incision ventral to the lingua facial vein dissect up alongside the larynx. This is uh, two of my fingers, so it's not a very large incision. We'll see the thyropharyngeus muscles and the cricopharyngeus muscles. We'll separate those and the larynx is underneath these two muscles. We place a suture to mimic the course of that muscle and then we permanently tie it open so that the horse stays open and is able to get his air. We then place the horse on his back and perform a laryngotomy. We're going to remove the vocal cord and remove this saccule so that gets rid of the noise that the horse is making. My name is David Rankin and I'm a clinical associate professor of anesthesiology here at the university, the teaching hospital. Most places have the same stuff that we do, you know, anesthesia machines and tubes and drugs and things like that. I think the thing that really makes us uh, a special place is the, the fact that we've got four faculty members who have just been doing this for ages, right? And it's very rare that we're surprised. Uh, I've been here for 13 years and I'm the new guy. There are four faculty members here and between the four of us, we have at least a hundred years of experience. So my role in this whole thing is to anesthetize the horse, maintain a degree of anesthesia that allows Dr. Beard or whatever surgeons involved you know, to do their thing, and then um, wake up. So when we get started, you know, we'll frequently end a tracheal tube, right? A tube that goes into the airway and we can give gas to anesthesia through this tube, oxygen, ventilate, uh, the things that we need to do. So we measure blood pressure, we measure pulse oximetry, you know, oxygen saturation uh, in the bloodstream. We measure carbon dioxide. We measure the in and out, the inhalant, whichever particular drug that is, ECG. If I have access to the head, eye signs are really useful. So the position of the horse's eye, uh, if it starts to move quickly, that's a sign to me that things are going to get ugly pretty fast, right? They're getting light and I need to intervene. Or if they have a blank or a spontaneous blank, something like that. 
all that kind of stuff adds up. So it turns into a thing where knowledge of pharmacology, knowledge of how the machine works, knowledge of what horses are like, and communicating with the surgeon, in this case, Dr. Beard, are the surgical needs being met. Uh, I was a surgeon at one point in my past. I don't care for it. So I'm very happy uh, working on this end of the horse and just letting him take care of uh, the things he needs to take care of. Laryngeal hemiplegia is among the more common causes of uh, respiratory impairment in performance horses. Curiously, it follows the size of the horse, so the largest breed horses are the most likely to be involved. It's very, very uncommon to have a horse smaller than a quarter horse, but when you see those eight horse Percheron and Belgian hitches, it would not be uncommon to have three or four of those horses be affected with this condition. The surgery has about a 90% chance of success in performance horses, and the, the condition won't recur unless the surgery fails for some reason. Horse after surgery uh, has three weeks of stall rest, three weeks of turnout, and then returns back to normal activity. I've been doing anesthesia almost exclusively for close to 30 years. And you know, in that time, I can count on one hand the number of times something has really gone poorly. You know, the numbers speak for themselves, I think. When we consider the number of horses that we do and the way that we do things, I think we've sort of dialed in on something that works. Out of all the places I've worked, and I've worked at a couple different universities and I've been in private practice, this is probably the place where the people have been here maybe the longest. And it's because people get along, uh, we communicate well, you know, as a faculty, surgeon, anesthesia, medicine, all that stuff. You know, we're all pet owners too. I've got some horses. Uh, we all got dogs and cats and occasional birds and fish and stuff like that. I mean, we get it. You know, clients come in and they've got concerns and frankly, we have the same concerns they do. And uh, not just the anesthesia people, I think everybody here. Um, we know what it's like to be a client because we've all been one. We continue to be clients, you know, as people help us with our own. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't think twice about anesthetizing my own horse for virtually anything. We've come a long way as a profession, I think, in addressing pain. Uh, and that improves the course of anesthetic. It improves recovery. Uh, you're doing your dog a favor, doing your horse a favor. I think bringing it here. Hey, don't touch that dial. We got more Better Horses TV right after this message from our sponsors. No matter what discipline of riding you do, training, showing, and everyday stress is hard on your horse's legs. Decra Veterinary Products is a leading lameness company that brought you Osphos. Osphos is a quadrinate injection, an intramuscular bisphosphonate to help control the clinical signs of navicular syndrome in horses four years and older. Ask your veterinarian if Osphos is right for your horse. Decra Veterinary Products is a proud sponsor of the American. In a natural, free roaming situation, horses graze nearly constantly throughout the day and night. When feeding horses in stables, it's ideal to try to mimic this feeding behavior. Horses in stabled conditions should be fed their hay so they can pick at it continuously between feedings. Visit our website at stanleeforage.com under nutrition, then nutritional resources to help transition your horse from winter to spring in the coming weeks. When you're a barrel racer, there are so many things that can bother a horse. Just eliminating the back issues is a huge advantage. I feel like using a CSI saddle pad has given me an advantage over other girls because I know that my horse is feeling good, that saddle's not bothering him. If you're looking for a new saddle pad, invest in a CSI. It's worth the investment. Ernie, it's so great to have you with us here today. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of Better Horses TV. 
I'm, I'm excited, Ernie, to have Colt out here with me today. He's on this Purina. And here's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about dealing with this Buddy Sour issue. But as we're doing that, I hope your viewers see what Colt is trying to accomplish with this horse because we're also addressing this idea of what we really want in our horses that we're going to be putting our kids on if we're talking about a kid horse. So this, this idea of a Buddy Sour horse, horses want to be together, it's fun for a horse to be together, especially when they're doing this. It's not so fun for horses to be together when they're working. So Colt and I are going to get busy, but I want you, I want your viewers, Ernie, to notice what Colt can get done with his horse. I'm going to talk Colt through what we're doing. Colt, I want you to come right over here on my right side. So I've got this, this stick with this sack on it, Ernie. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a little noise and movement to the mix. So Colt, I want you to trot right up here beside me. I'm going to roll my horse up to a lope. Colt, I want you to lope, just lope right beside me, okay? So roll your horse up here in the lope, left lead. On the outside, bud. You got to lope a little faster. So here's where the, here's where our, our fun starts to happen, Ernie, for Colt. He's building a lot of confidence now to, to be able to speed up, to lope around, to go a little bit faster. So he's out here saying, now, Dad, how do I get my horses to not be stuck on wherever you go on your horse? So I'm just going to say, well, if your horse wants to be with mine, Colt, just come right along here and you can lope with me. Colt, can you speed up a little bit? There you go. There you go. I'm going to make a little noise right here, see if I can bother his horse a little bit. See, I want his horse to not be bothered by the noise and movement of this flag. I want his horse to not be bothered by the life and energy that comes up in my horse that tends to carry over into the other horses that are around. Okay, get on up here beside me, bud. I'll hand you this flag. <laughs> you got it? All right, you got to get the, get a hold of the handle of it. Now you make some noise with it. Just stay right there on that circle. There you go. Had a boy. He just loping around. You see how I'm, I've got my horse pretty close to his, and Ernie will just be here loping around for a little bit. Now switch hands, Colt. There you go. Go ahead and slow down there, had a boy. So I'm gonna let Colt just sit right there and I'm gonna stop right here. So the idea there, Ernie, is these horses want to be together out of instinct, out of their safety in numbers, out of I gotta be near other horses or I'm, I feel more secure when there's other horses around because that means we have more eyes and more ears to see things that might sneak up on us. <clears throat> but I'll promise you, as we invest time like this, where his horse is close to my horse and we're loping around together and we turn that into work, pretty soon that horse over there and this horse right here is saying, I don't want anywhere near that horse. Then we split and we let him rest like we are right here. But again, if you guys have been watching how Colt's loping around, He's got a lot of confidence out there. His horse is steering where he wants to go. He doesn't mind going fast. We can add some things to the mix. I don't have to worry about, well, if somebody else is making a lot of noise, just come right around here beside me, Colt. If somebody else is making a lot of noise on their horse out here in this arena, or I take him to a, a clinic somewhere, <clears throat> you know, we're out here trying to create that noise, that movement that might show up somewhere else that's outside of our control just to get our horse's minds ready for it. But more than anything, I'm trying to get his mind ready for it too. And guys, if, if you're gonna approach this idea of Buddy Sour Horse, it's really easy to change if you just think about it from that perspective. But throwing him in the mix saying, I want that in my kid horses, guys, this is what changes everything and this is what makes it easy to build confidence in these guys as they're sitting on your horse. So Ernie, I know this is throwing a lot at your audience. I know that I'm not, I'm not saying by any means that y'all just need to throw your kids up there and go loping around and lope up beside them and wave this flag. This is something we're working up to, but this will tell us a lot about our horses as we're working up to that point. You get there, 
<clears throat> what you're going to do is you're going to have a frame of mind in your horse where you just made it a lot safer for your kids while they're riding your horses around. So Ernie, I hope that's something that can benefit your viewers. Thank you so much for letting us be on your show. You guys can go to kerrycoon.com to find out more about what we do, our clinics, our horses, and hope to see you down the road. Thank you, Ian. Thank you again, Ernie. Closed captioning has been brought to you by Lina Weaver and Flattail Ranch. John Deere is known for quality equipment. This quality has created a perception that John Deere is more expensive than other brands. But high quality doesn't mean high price. The truth from buyers in our area is customers who have purchased a John Deere compact utility tractor saved more than $2,000 dare to compare us before buying. You and your wallet will be surprised. Nothing runs as long as a deer, and we'll prove it with our exclusive 10-year warranty. Visit heritagetractor.com slash compare to learn more. How's your production on pasture? Our profits down? Our weight gains down? What are you going to do about it? Do something cost effective. Do something that will make a difference. To add the first and proven leader in feed through horn fly control to your cattle rations, ask for it by name, Altacid IGR. What do you get? when you bring together one of the biggest names in veterinary medicine with one of the most caring and committed teams of horse health experts in the industry, you get a vaccine portfolio known for its quality and safety, a pharmaceutical line you can rely on to help manage pain and support performance. You get the products, programs, and people of Merck Animal Health. Hey, thank you for watching Better Horses. If you've missed any of our episodes, you can check us out at betterhorses.com where you can see all our shows. You can also find us on Facebook or listen to any of our podcasts right from your mobile device. And don't forget our newspaper coming out five times a year also on the same website. You're going to love it.